Welcome. Are you ready to dig into Genesis again? This is the Torah, the book of Moses that we're looking at, Genesis, and we're going to start with the end of chapter 2. But let's pray before we get into it, and then we'll dig in. Thank you, Lord, for this, your word. Thank you for your kindness to us and giving it to us. Show us what we're to learn about you, about ourselves, about what we should do, and the things that we see are presented to us by our adversary. Help us to live in the knowledge and wisdom that comes from you. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Let's start in in Genesis chapter 2, verse 25. And let's look at the way that Adam and Eve lived. We have a statement here. It says, And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. And I want you to think, this is way more than just not having to get dressed in the morning when they got up. This was a whole perspective on life that they began with. It was it shaped how they approached new things, how they trusted each other, their security and trust of God. They felt no bashful embarrassment. They didn't fear being vulnerable. Or they were open, unselfconscious, and and they weren't afraid of being judged. With self-awareness, not blemished by thoughts of guilt or inadequacy, life seemed just there to be lived. They could approach it without fear. They could uh discover new things and not be scared of what it would what it would mean just think of what it would be like to approach your new situations in the same way um what if you had to make big life choices and never had to be afraid of how it was going to turn out or think about um no fear of failure or without being concerned about how how much time you were going to spend on something because time had no meaning you were going to you're healthy and you're going to live and live and live. And you thought, why? Why Why hurry? Or how about without worrying about some far-reaching future thing that's going to come of this decision? And they didn't have to think that way. So you're introduced to the man and his wife. Both of them are in this state of innocence, this, this secure frame of mind. And then we're introduced to a wild creature, a serpent. And he begins a discussion with the woman about trees. The serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, indeed, as God said, you're not to eat from any tree of the garden. This was chapter three, verse one. We're told that there are two specific trees that were especially pointed out. In chapter two, verse nine and verses 16 and 17, we're told about the tree of life, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And God made one specific command, and it was to not eat from the fruit of that second tree, this tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God made very clear, the day that you eat of it, your doom is sealed, and your death will result for sure. The way the complete Jewish Bible says it is, you are not to eat from it, because on the day that you eat from it, it will become certain that you will die. We saw last time, looking at chapter 3, verse 1, that the serpent made an absurd question. He said, did God say you can't eat any of this fruit around here? And he made a wide reference of all the trees because he's getting ready to zero the woman's attention in on one tree. And the way he did it was to make her look at all of them and, and think of how silly that was. And we need to pick up on something here, first of all. That beast, that serpent, was not just a troublemaking animal that came out of the jungle to, to, to mess with Eve. It was a tool of Satan. It made use of, he was made to be the instrument of, of Satan's attack on God's creation. The name Satan means adversary. And in actual fact, he is an adversary who is out to destroy what God had created. In Ezekiel chapter 28, as a matter of fact, we get some information as we read about the influencer behind the king of Tyre as, as Ezekiel announces this from God, this prophecy about him. In chapter 28 of Ezekiel, verse 13, it says, You were in Eden, the garden of God. Well, the man, the king of Tyre, wasn't in Eden, but the serpent behind him was, the devil behind him was. In verse 15 of Ezekiel 28, we read, You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created until unrighteousness was found in you. 
And verse 16 says, you were internally filled with violence and you sinned. And you see the downward progression of something that God created beautiful and, and, and sinless. And he became sinful in his own pride and his own ambition. In John 8, verse 44, Jesus says this about the devil. It says, he was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he's a liar and the father of lies. His reality is based on his own lies. And in Revelation 12 and verse 9, it says, And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, he's called, who is called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. This is who was dealing with Eve. In the form of this serpent, I have no doubt that the serpent was a beautiful creature, the way that God originally made it. But in this encounter in Genesis 3, it's spiritual warfare. It's not just a couple of creatures talking to each other. This is a spiritual thing. Our adversary understood the full import of what was at stake. He knew that if he caused them to violate God's command, they would die. And yet he urged and pushed and lured him towards that and watched him die. He was a murderer from the beginning. As you read chapter 3, verses 2 and 3, the woman said to the serpent, from the, tree of the, from the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat from it or touch it, or you'll die. So Eve answers his absurd question and says, well, sure, we can eat of all these, except for that one tree where it's off limits. We're supposed to stay away from it. And the point is that it sounds like Eve adds to the instruction. When God commanded Adam in chapter 2 and verse 17 to not eat the fruit, that was the command. Don't eat that fruit. But in 3.3, Eve says they aren't supposed to eat it or even touch the fruit. Now, perhaps when Adam was telling Eve what God had told him, he added to what God said just to make his point to stay away from that tree. Or maybe Eve in, to herself was trying to express that she understood they were not supposed to go anywhere near that tree or eat its fruit. In either case, she didn't have to wonder about what God said. She knew good and well. It was clear to her that she was not to eat that fruit. Recall, in the center of the garden, there were two trees, two trees of note. In chapter 2, verse 9, it tells us about the tree of life. It says it was also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The tree of life had no restriction on it, and it must have been right there at the same time. But it didn't stand out because they had access to it just like they did to the pomegranates and all the other stuff that was out there. So you get into chapter 3 and verses 4 and 5. The servant said to the woman, you surely will not die. And here Satan drops all his pretense. He drops all his funny question answering and, about, and talking about other fruits. His agenda homes in on his challenge of God's truth, God's goodness, and God's integrity. God had said to Adam, you will surely die if you eat this. Satan just outright said God lied. You absolutely will not die, he said. In verse 5, the adversary goes on to imply that God wasn't even thinking of their welfare. Verse 5 says, For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. He says, God's not even thinking of your welfare at all. He's hoarding his knowledge. He's trying to keep it from you. He's trying to keep you down. He's trying to keep you from really seeing the way that he sees things. And so he casts doubt on God's very integrity that, that God must have ulterior motives that weren't trustworthy. And here's Satan's master deception. He accuses God of shutting her out of becoming like him. Here's a fact. Eve was never more like God than she was right here before she'd ever taken that fruit. In Genesis 5, verses 1 and 2, it says this, On the day that God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. He created them male and female. He blessed them and called them Adam, or humankind, and on the day that, on the day that they were created. 
But the enemy painted God as a stingy, insecure God who wouldn't share and implied that Eve was not enough the way she was. Now pay attention here. Eve was complete as God made her in his own likeness, and Satan planted the seed that she was not enough the way she was. Both ideas are still perpetuated today. In our times, I get so frustrated looking at ads, for example. Women's self-image is attacked on multiple fronts every day. You're not beautiful enough. You need our makeup or our deodorant or our soap or our clothes. You're not slim enough. You need our diet plan or our pills or our gym membership. You aren't smart enough. You need another college degree or a new support group or better friends. You're not good enough. You need another self-help course or another book on self-esteem or a better job that shows your worth. And on and on and on. One thing after another. It's always you're not enough the way you are. You need something more. And both men and women compare themselves to other people. And they are looking constantly to see if they are enough. If they have enough. If they matter at all. And social media is a terrible place to go to to try and find your worth, to weigh yourself, to see if you measure up to other people. It's nasty. When I was in the Navy, there was an announcement that used to come, and it would begin this way. Now hear this. Now hear this. And what that meant is, pay close attention. This is important. Don't miss this. And so I'm saying, now hear this. Lay aside your doubt. Here's a truth that you can know, and you can know it for a fact. It's rock solid, and your feelings can't cancel it out. Listen to this. Titus 3, verses 4 through 7. But when the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we've done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of new birth and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. It's not about your performance. It's about his. Your worth is not depend, dependent on whether you've succeeded or failed. It's God who's taken on himself the work to make it you redeem, to show you that you're worthwhile. Romans 5, verses 6 to 8. For while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for a good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. His love for us is real, and it's shown by the fact that he did real things. He sent his son who grew up here and lived and died and was raised from the dead. Real payment for your sin because he cared about us. And whether you feel worthy or not, you are worthy because he gave it all for you. Romans 8.1, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Notice those two words. There is therefore now, meaning as of this time and forever, no condemnation, not a, none, not any zilch. There's no condemnation left. God does not condemn you. You are worth all that God did for you. To him, you matter. Your worth is not based on your performance or how you feel about yourself. Let your feelings be shaped by what's true. Christ loves you with an everlasting love. And I want to add just one more thing. Might be more than one more thing, but you need, you need to hear this. What did God do about the, the attack on this woman's worth that Satan started in her? What did he do? Well, we know that he sent his son to redeem fallen people, to save them. There's two verses in the Bible I want to share with you. The first one, if you want to know the why of God's salvation, John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He loved 
us in the world so much that he sent his son that was uniquely born in a, in a unique way, different than any other to him, his only begotten son, so that whoever would believe in him would not perish and have eternal life. That tells you the why of what God did. But there's another verse that tells you the what of it. And I, I love this. In Revelation 3.20, it says this, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Now, when it says he's standing at the door, this is Jesus talking, and he means he's knocking on the door into you, into your heart. Now, we, we refer to the heart as being the core of a person, the inside part, because of when we're tense, it our inside here tightens up. When we're happy, it, it bubbles. When we're, when we're sad, it feels heavy. And so we refer to that as a heart. But what we mean is the inner, inner center of our being, the place where we are at home. This is the real us. With everything else stripped away, the place where we are in our most private place. He says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. I stand to come in to you. He says, if anyone hears my voice, and will open a door, I will come in to him, and will sup with him, and he with me, in old King James. It means he'll come in, and, and he will share the kind of close fellowship that people who love each other and share a meal when you sit around the table, and you're enjoying each other's company and enjoying the filling that comes. And guess who brings the feast? The Lord Jesus, who is the one that fed thousands from a little sack lunch, and who is able to produce when when there was nothing else. He's the one who brings the feast. It's not you supplying it. You just open the door. And what it's talking about is when you bring Christ in, he comes in to have fellowship contact, the kind of satisfying connection when you are with people you love, enjoying the grandest of banquets. And this is what salvation is, for you to open up, to invite the Lord Jesus into your heart, to say, come in, Lord Jesus, forgive my sins, clean me up from all unrighteousness, live and dwell in me and be my Lord, my Savior. I believe what you did on the cross was for me. You paid for all my sin. I believe that you rose from the dead and you give eternal life. I believe that you love me and want to be in my heart. Come in. Be there. Ask him. That's that simple. That's where it starts. You get to grow from there. You get to continue on to much more. But it all begins from that first commitment to open up and have Christ come in and do his work there. The seeds for self-doubt were planted clear from the beginning. We have harvested the awful results of that from every generation as people doubted themselves. If they didn't measure up in the old days, if women didn't have children, they felt like they were rejected. Or if someone wasn't up to snuff when it came to the way they looked, or, or, or if they had some physical flaw. And the Lord said, that's not it. It's your heart. You're worth it to me. I will save you if you call on me believing I will save you. That's the good news of the gospel. God did something about it. Satan planted the seed of being insecure. God said, be secure in me. Let me supply what you need. It's good stuff. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this, your word. When we see the attacks and the way the adversary came at Eve, and we see the results of that in lives of ourselves or people that we know, that feeling of inadequacy, that wondering if we make up, if we matter at all, the Lord demonstrated that we matter. He did real things to bring about our reconciliation, our being brought into his family, brought in to be with him. I pray that as this word goes out, that you would touch lives and that you would open hearts and cause people to respond to you and to receive the blessing of your salvation. Thank you. May God be praised in all the harvest of those you bring to yourself. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. This good news is something that's well worth talking about and it's well worth letting people know during this time when there's so much criticism going on. 
Keep up. Look to God. Let Him show you you're worth it. God bless you and we'll see you next time.